I want to share today is what I'll call a, a computational approach um, to political communication research. And in this case, some comparative research. We're going to look at an N of two, uh, uh, the US and France. Um, and we're looking specifically at the presidential campaigns uh, uh, via data we harvested from Twitter. And this is a, a retrieval of campaign-specific keywords and hashtags from the garden hose. Now, what's the garden hose? The garden hose is a 10% sample of Twitter that Twitter provides to people who have enhanced API access. Anyone can ask Twitter for what's called the trickle, which is 1%. And if you want fire hose access, which is everything, you have to pay for it and pay pretty uh, 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 high cost. Um, what we want to use this for is to focus on high intensity moments of social media centered around key US and French presidential debates. It's kind of moments of national conversation, moments where we see a strong connection between media and what's happening in terms of the social space. And so to do this, we did, we're going to show some overtime plots of keywords and, and network maps of retweets of these echo chambers. So data structure here was the garden hose, 10% sample of global tweets. We get about 40 to 50 million posts a day. We've collected over 16 terabytes of data at this point from February 2012 to March 2014. And we analyze it using the Apache Hadoop framework. It's a parallel processing framework, free and open. You don't have to pay for it. All you need is a computer to put it on. Okay. Um, we drew uh, um, uh, posts around keywords on a 50-day window before the election, so the periods of the actual elections in France and the US 50 days before that. And we used the hashtag or name of any candidate with over 0.5% of the vote in either election. So you can see the list of who we included in our keyword polls there. Here's what's interesting. If you want to plot the French election, well, that's the first round vote. That's Twitter activity and the mention of particular candidate names. And so Holland is the one who's getting the highest coverage there. Same with the first debate. And that's election day. Public events are moments of social media activity. You want to look at the US? That's the first debate. That's the VP debate. And Biden suddenly makes an appearance. Second debate. Third debate, election. Those overtime peaks, besides election days, the biggest peaks on Twitter activity correspond to the presidential debates. Debates spur intense activity and expression. In the US, just during the period of the debate, 10 million tweets were sent. A great example of this from outside of politics is Ellen DeGeneres, when she hosted the Oscars, broke Twitter by saying, please retweet this photograph. So I think of this as really clear support for this notion of the second screen. We are using social media this way. It's about the relationship between conventional media and social media oftentimes. It's an opportunity for us to express, to dissect, to correct, to spin, to joke. We do a lot of things in that moment. And it's something that we need to look at more carefully. Now the question is, do, do the debates equal actual discussion among the public? That's a deeper question. I'm going to see how much time I have here. So Homero can't say I went long. Oh, no, no. 33 minutes. 33. Um, <laughs> closer attention to moments of intense activity. Um, so we did cumulative plots of the six-hour windows around the debates. Now here's the other thing. When you're dealing with literally tens of millions of tweets, you can get really granular. You can look at really specific instances in a way that Again, I don't think of this as quantitative or qualitative. It's a, it's a mixed method, right? I'm not running statistical tests. I'm using data to plot things. But the interpretation is very qualitative. So what is this as a method? It's something new. What I want to look at here is share of voice. Who's being mentioned when? And then ultimately look at the, the alignments and polarization. So this is minute by minute coverage of the French debate. What you see is very little activity beforehand, a little bit intense activity during, and each of these dots is minute by minute mentions of each of the two candidates participating in the event. And then the drop off afterwards. And the drop off in France is steep. Why is that? Because the debate was on very late <laughs> at night. It was on at, I think, 9 to 10 or 10 to 11, and the minute it ended, people went to sleep, right? It, was, it lasted for an hour and a half or two hours. Um, if you want to look at the overall share of voice or volume, what you see is the candidate that supposedly won tends to dominate 
the conversation. And what's even fa more fascinating here is they dominate the conversation during, and then it just kind of stays in that pattern, heading out. Compare that to the US, where very, very little activity leading up, intense activity during, but then a su substantial amount of trailing activity, considerable post-debate conversation, the spin room. <coughs> How are we being told to interpret the debate? What do we see here? Obama has a slight advantage heading in, Romney quickly eclipses him and maintains a slight advantage in terms of share of voice throughout, but then that share of voice expands as we get into the post-debate commentary and people and the analysis is Obama lost that debate. Romney won that debate. So keyword mentions uh, uh, conflicts and barbs that spur an outpouring of posts. Uh, greater share of voice for winning candidates. Uh, uh, polls declared Holland and Romney as the winners of the only uh, 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 two-candidate French debate and the, uh, uh, the first presidential debate in the U.S. And we do see kind of three phases of this national conversation. The intermittent discussions before the start, there was more of that in France, maybe simply a function of what time of the day it aired. Heightened peaking discussion during the event, very parallel in France and the US, and then rapidly dec declining return to equity, slower in the US and more evidence of kind of post-debate spin shaping which candidate was preferred. Now, the last part of this is retweet networks. So we can compare pre-post debate networks in terms of mapping the connections and conversations about the candidates and support for the candidates. So networks were generated uh, 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 from all retweeting behaviors of users they graph the partisan expression of the largest connected components of networks. So we did Team Obama, Obama 2012, and Vote Obama versus Team Romney, Romney 2012, and uh, uh, Can't Afford Four More, which was the other big hashtag used to support Romney. In, in the French case, Avec Sarkozy and uh, 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 Vote Hollande were the two dominant hashtags. This is the pre-debate for France. Little clusters of activity, but not much. This is during the debate itself, highly polarized, very clearly divided, with a very strong and core cluster here for Helen. <laughs> it's, like it's like an embankment. It's like they're fighting them off uh, 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 for Sarkozy. Afterwards, remains a fair amount of partisan division, but much less activity because it fell off so drastically. Compare that to the US case. Minimal activity leading in, almost nothing. Like waiting for the event to start. The event begins and it's intense activity. And it's, but it's not about advocating for either candidate so much as it is just general political conversation with pockets in various places. So you see more of a Romney support here, some pockets, but you can see interspersed very clearly with red and blue side by side. What happens afterwards? More of a partisan division afterwards in the US as we see it kind of spinning and moving apart in terms of evaluation. So I, I was wondering if, you know, for example, the 10 million mm -hmm. tweets during the first presidential debate here, if you can then interpret that as compared to sure. how many people and, and how many viewers uh, on that show. So uh, let me and show the you. Second thing, and, I, and I, then you can, you can answer both um, 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 uh, simultaneously. The other, the other thing that strikes me is the network analysis that you showed. And I'm always uncomfortable with that because like everyone else, this is eye candy to me. It's like, whoa. I mean, you, you heard people here saying go, whoa. And it's <laughs> because, it, because it's impressive, it's fascinating, it's intriguing. But I can't interpret that properly. And, and I've, sometimes I've spoken to people who actually do those softwares, asking them, for example, the fact that these blue dots are to the right of the red dots, what does that tell me? Does that tell me that this, they, ah, not really, why are those red dots there? Well, because there was no room left to, 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 over there, so we had, you know, the software puts it there, otherwise it overlaps and you can't see them. But instinctively, we say, oh, but these are to the right, these are to the left, so there's a divide there. Well, actually, we might be over-interpreting that. So, again, what advice can you give us as to how to properly interpret those? I mean, there's no other way to, to do than visually, but then visual can be misleading. Well, okay, so let me answer both those questions. One is, Typically what we're showing here is proportional use, right? So not just raw volume, but of the total amount of volume at any given point in time, how much of it was devoted to this topic. So we're taking into account what the actual total volume at any given point in time is, because there's huge cycles. 
during the nighttime hours, there's very little tweeting going on. During the daylight hours, there's more. At, during uh, the period from 7 to 10 at night, there's a fair amount of Twitter activity as people respond to their TV sets. So you have to do it proportionally to overall volume. You have to take proportion into account. So that's the first question, which is, yes. I mean, we can't just show raw volume because raw volume doesn't tell us a whole lot. So they go, oh, there's 10 million tweets, but 10 million tweets relative to what, right? So, so that's number one. So proportionality becomes critical to put it into a, into a, to compare apples to apples. So is this a heavy moment of activity relative to other moments? Um, second part in terms of the network mapping, um, all the network mapping we're doing is uh, using uh, uh, multi-dimensional scaling and it's, it's not us choosing to place people somewhere. It's actually based on the algorithms of network indices saying if there's a higher level of centrality for a certain uh, uh, node, it should be placed more centrally in the network. If a set of nodes are more interconnected, they should be clustered together. So I disagree that the network maps don't tell you anything. I think they tell you a great deal. And I think they tell you... Well, because our instinct is to say things which are high or low or left or right mean something. And sometimes the algorithm puts something here because it couldn't put it there because it would overlap. But sometimes, I mean, you see that even with textual analysis software. Does that tell me something? No, it doesn't. You know, so it, we need to be trained into, you know, not, not, not the, the drawing the wrong conclusion from what we see. No, I think that's true. I think the other answer to that is, is then also actually not just mapping the networks, but actually looking at the actual network uh, uh, indices and comparing uh, uh, what the features of the actual networks are. 